Hello, welcome back. So today I'm going to be doing another review of one of my watches. It's going to be the uh, Longine 2361-4. Um, the I think the uh, model number, the reference number is 2361-4. I think it's the indication of the color of the dial so I'm guessing blue is dash 4 I have seen another color that's like whitish silver um, but there could be other other color dial as well but I have not seen any um, this is a vintage alarm watch mechanical alarm watch um, not sure when this was made um, the movement was made from 1973 to 1977 and browsing through some of the vintage uh, Longines catalogs I did find a very similar model to this the Longines 2339 in the 73 to 74 catalog so this could be from you know 75 because the 2339 <coughs> was similar to this, but it was just a uh, three-hander without the alarm. So this could have came out uh, maybe a year or two later. Um, looking through the archives, this could be the only Longines mechanical alarm watch, but I'm not too sure. And... Um, for some reason, this has like a kind of like a following within the Italian community. Like, if you search this watch, you can find it by typing Longines uh, 2361. But if you type in the Italian word for alarm, um, Suevarino, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry, but. Yeah, if you type in the Italian word for alarm along with Longines, this watch will come up with more result hits. So, I'm not sure. Maybe this was marketed to the Italian um, community more. Um, nevertheless, so this is a pretty unique, um, I guess, shape. I will probably classify this as a TV dial. Um, you know, it's not a complete square because there's some roundness to it. Um, although some people would call this cushion, um, I like to define cushion case as the outer edge being similar to this, but the inside crystal needs to be circular. And if that's the case, then I would consider it a cushion. In this one, the outer case is a cushion case, but the inside crystal is also not circular, more squarish. So in my mind, I consider this a uh, TV dial. Um, it was, you know, after the Royal Oak, so it had this trend having this uh, integrated bracelet design. And it happens to have the blue dial, so it's really like, I guess, an homage to that, even though it came out maybe one to two years after it. Um, this is my first vintage Swiss watch. Um, you know, it was made in the 70s, um, so I'm guessing back then when it says it's Swiss made, you don't have to really worry if 100% or however many percent is actually made in Swiss. This is probably mostly made in Swiss, but you know. All right, so let's talk about some of the specs. Um, this watch uh, measures in at about 37.5 in case width or diameter. And um, the lug to lug is measuring at 43.5 because the bracelet does protrude out. 
um, the thickness I think it's one of the downside of this watch is 14 14 isn't too bad but you know if you're going for that um, Royal Oak uh, integrated blue blue dot watch I think having a thicker watch doesn't really fit that look but other other than that it's pretty uh, pretty nice the uh, what it wears like if you do the calculation based on surface area it just wears more closer to a 40 millimeter round watch uh, so my wrist is uh, seven and a half and yeah it's about a 40 millimeter watch I would say the uh, stainless steel and the uh, glass is uh, plexiglass um, or acrylic and then the movement <coughs> is an automatic the Longine called this the um, L680.1 but it is basically based on the uh, AS500A um, I will go into more detail about the movement and the history I think like uh, for this review I'm going to add in a component where I talk about the history of the al mechanical alarm watch at the end um, so if you're not interested in that you can just don't watch that part um, but yeah it does have a few interesting quirks about the evolution of the movements when it and eventually finding its way into this the AS5008 so this movement like I said it was um, created in 1973 AS stands for Adolf Shield um, it, he's actually the uh, brother of uh, the founder of Eterna who is Urs Shield, I believe. Um, this movement is actually nicknamed the uh, Brainmatic. I'm not sure who came up with that. I would, if I were to guess, it's probably uh, kind of a play on the Seiko Bellmatic. Um, it has 180 components in it. Runs at. Uh, Runs at four, 4 hertz, power reserve of 40 hours. It has two barrels, one for timekeeping, one for alarm. And this movement could be um, found with 17, 21, or 25 joules. Um, there's also another version of this that was made in the 2000 with 31 joules. These were, I guess, like they found like a batch of new old stock, and uh, I believe the company, um, what was it, Gerard Perigot, maybe? Yeah, they they bought a whole bunch of them and then upgraded them into the thirty-one jewel version. <clears throat> so. This movement is an automatic with a central rotor. Uh, it's bi-directionally winding, but the each direction actually winds a different barrel. So one direction winds the timekeeping barrel, and the other direction winds the alarm, which was, um, I think, the only movement for alarm watch that did that. I think JLC, Memovox, and Seiko Belmatic did not do that. Um, it has a day date with dual quick set. So like, okay, so dual quick set. There you go. You can do the quick set here. Um, it actually has two different language discs. And um, for this watch, it came in um, 
German and French, I believe. But I think there's also English, maybe there's even an Italian one. Uh, and then the, um, the date change is actually instantaneous as well. So let me show you this. I don't know if this is noon or or midnight. Okay, this is noon. Okay, so let's see. Huh? Oh, there you go. So yeah, it changed over instantaneously. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> the for this watch, uh, I think one of the downside is that the hammer where it makes the alarm sound, it was placed in between the movement and the dial. Um, so it didn't hit the case back, which was how the Memo Vox and the Vulcan Cricket did it. And those ones, they made a very loud sound. This one, because it didn't do that design, the sound is not as loud. And I think they wrote it was about 57 decibel for eight seconds. Um, the alarm indicator is this line here. It could be set to roughly around five minute uh, accuracy. Uh, they say it has 144 different markings. And the uh, alarm is activated <clears throat> by pulling out the crown, which is like the opposite of the memo box. Um, so you'll activate it and then the crown will be pulled out. So let's try. This is uh, 3, 3.15ish. Oh wait, sorry, 2.15. Yeah. You want to shut it off before it go um, before it ends a, a second. You can just push it in to end it quickly. <clears throat> so I find this kind of neat. Um, I'm not sure if I would like how the memo box does it, whereas you know the the alarm would be activated when the crown is pushed in and deactivated to while it's pulled out. Because I don't really use the alarm function that much so if I got a memo box um, to keep the alarm off I would have to have the crown pulled out all the time which I don't find that very um, safe for the movement um, anyways so <clears throat> I think I mentioned the um, the modern variant had 31 jewels um, it was made by Gerard Perigot and how you can tell just from looking from afar is that their movement usually the day dates are se separated to the uh, 12 and 6 o'clock position respectively um, they call their movement the uh, uh, LJP 5800 and 5900. The 5900, they added a uh, GMT function into it. And it has been seen in a few different high end watches such as Mont Blanc, uh, Maurice Lacroix, Gerard Perigo, uh, and Panerai, actually, as well. <clears throat> so to uh, to operate this watch, you got two crowns. The top crown is mainly for um, timekeeping, and the bottom is for uh, alarm. So timekeeping, you can um, 
position zero, I guess you can just wind it, hand winding. Um, the uh, position two, clockwise and counterclockwise, each has a quick set function. In position two, you can uh, set the time. For alarm, it's just two positions. Position zero, you wind the alarm. And position one, you can set the alarm and also is to activate the alarm okay so let me just put this back for a second all right so i think that's everything i will talk about about this watch i'll add in some pictures showing the different um as 5000 family movements there are a few different versions, uh, some with just a date, some as manual. Uh, but yeah, this is the main bulk of this review. I'm going to start going into a little bit about the, um, the history of mechanical alarm watches. Um, this all, most of the information I got was from a article called the Curious History of Alarm Watches on Beyond the Dial. It was written by James Wren. Uh, but for some reason, um, when you go on their website, you can't find that article anymore. So, like, I saved that article way back. And uh, I'm just going to kind of do a little presentation on it. I don't want to really take credit because most of the information is from... James Wren from Beyond the Dial. It's just I can't find this article. It's kind of a shame. So I'll start adding in some slides to kind of uh, visualize what I'm talking about. All right. So the um, first mechanical alarm, I want to put the alarm in quotation, watch was, it. I don't know the brand, but it is a filigree bracelet and what it does was it didn't use sound it actually had a small pin that came out to poke the wrist to kind of set the uh, sound the alarm it was mostly for female and uh, it was all the way back in 1876 yeah Okay, so next, in 1914, this would be kind of the first true mechanical alarm watch. And uh, this was made by Eterna. The movement was the 42203. It was the first watch to use a gone hammer system. And the first series was actually a transitional piece between a pocket watch so you can see a pocket watch version of it. And then the first series had this little uh, pointer or divot on the four o'clock position, which is basically a sign that they basically took the pocket watch movement and transferred into a, a wrist watch. The later versions didn't have that. And um, you can see by the middle picture. Um, it had a double case back to increase the sound, but it didn't have any perforations like the Vulcan, which I will talk about in a few seconds. It didn't have any running second. Uh, what was interesting was that you set the alarm by rotating the bezel. And the uh, it had one barrel and the alarm lasted for about seven seconds. Then there was not much development until 1947. This was kind of the uh, the big boom for alarm, mechanical alarm watch. And this was famously made by Vulcan. They call it the Cricket, caliber 120. This was a very innovative uh, movement. They made perforations on the uh, on the second case back and put a membrane in between it so then 
the sound just amplifies so much and it was actually enough to wake people up from you know sleep um it had two barrels instead of one which was also another innovation uh one was for the alarm the other was for timekeeping it only had the initial ones only had one crown to wine and you can wind both barrels, one in each direction, which is also pretty neat. It was very loud and the alarm could last almost 30 seconds. Um, it became known as the uh, president watch because multiple presidents wore it. And they even made a, uh, a version with the presidential seal on it. Maybe it wasn't for the public. Maybe it was just a gift to people in the Oval Office. Um, there were a few other versions later on. There's the cricket calendar, which they added the day function. It was caliber 401 and 402. Um, that one had uh, two crowns. and But the date was a uh, non-quick set. And it only had one barrel. Um, there's one which is called the Golden Voice, caliber 406. That one was one of the smallest uh, mechanical alarm watch. The movement was only 8.3 mm. And the watch were probably about only 22 mm. So for usually for ladies. And the alarm wasn't that loud because it's a small barrel. It only lasted 7 seconds. There was also the uh, Vulcan Cricket Nautilus, um, which was like a, a diver. It had like some kind of different graduated measuring instrument on it. I think for like, I'm not too sure what it's for, but yeah, there's another one. So two years after the Cricket in 1949, JLC came to the scene with their very first memo box, uh, caliber 489. So this was JLC's first series production of alarm watch. Um, there was some other JLC produced alarm watch since the 1929, but they were like ultra high end, um, non non series production. Uh, JLC couldn't use the um, cricket design, so the alarm was quieter because it didn't have the double case back. Uh, the early model, they kind of try it, tried it in a different method by making this weird lug that lifted off your wrist. So when the watch vibrated, it didn't get muffled by your, your skin. Um, and the locks were also hollow tubes. This had um, a double barrel. Uh, one of the unique design aspects was instead of a, a pointer, they used a disc in the middle to set the alarm. And it lasted about 20 seconds. All right, so then a few years later, in 1954, this was when um, Adolf Shield started to make one of the most ubi ubiquitous mechanical alarm movement, the 1475. Um, it's characterized by the uh, tri-corner central bridge, which, yeah, it's very distinctive. Some interesting facts is Adolf Shield was the brother of the founder of Eterna, Urs Shield. And this uh, Adolf Shield's company eventually merged back into ETA in 1979. So it's interesting because one of the first um, mechanical alarm watch was made by Eterna. And as you will see later in the presentation, the Adolf Shield movement was one one of the last mechanical alarm movement before the uh, quartz crisis. Um, so I had it was a manual. It was 
two crowns, two barrels, had a pointer hand, and uh, 15 second alarm, I had the double case back. Uh, two years later, the AS1568 came out. They added a date, but still, it was not a quick set. In 1957, it started to license out this movement to other prominent brands. Uh, most famously was the uh, <coughs> Tudor Advisor, uh, 7926. And yeah, some other brands that used it was Gerard Perigot. Uh, they are known to have this small crescent shaped date. Um, Pojot also had a similar one, but had one extra jewel. Not sure if it was actually licensed to them or they just copied it or stole it. Who knows? Um, Citizen also used that movement. It had 21 jewels, so I'm not sure what the difference is. Uh, 1956, um, this was a big moment. JLC Memo Box Caliber A15, A25. It was the world's first automatic alarm watch. And it was a big deal because if you think about how a traditional mechanical alarm watch worked was the case back had a kind of like a metal pin uh, going to somewhere along the movement and then the movement side had a hammer that kind of struck that pin to make the sound but if you had a rotor spinning around in there it would kind of mess up that pin so the challenge was they weren't able to do a 360 degree full rotor for the automatic. So JLC implemented a 270 degree bumper system, which allowed an automatic mechanical alarm watch. Um, then it was a big jump, um, 1966, almost 10 years later, Seiko came into the scene with the Seiko Belmatic caliber 4006A. Uh, this was you know, loved by many Seiko enthusiasts. The, um, the indicator arrow was mounted on the inner rotating bezel, which is very unique for uh, the design and kept the dial very elegant. Um, the timekeeping winding was only done through the rotor, uh, Seiko's magic lever. So you could wind the alarm, but you couldn't manually wind the timekeeping side. And it was likely the very first automatic alarm watch with a full 360 degree rotor. Um, and it was probably the most advanced uh, movement until the AS5008 about seven years later. Um, it had the day date, two barrels, uh, one crown was, well, one crown was to wind the, the alarm and set the time. The other button at the top was for the quick set actually. The alarm lasted for about 10 seconds. So you you may be wondering like how did they do a 360 and kept the alarm function uh, well basically they invented this new uh, gong system where the hammer struck to a, a piece of metal inside the movement and set up the case back I believe it's that little ring but I'm not too sure Okay, so three years later, uh, JLC came back with the Caliber 916 Memo Vox, and this was when they finally kind of used the 360 rotor system. Yeah, and their system was very innovative again, because if you look at the movement, the rotor center was hollowed out for a pin to like drop in from the case back 
and then a hammer would hit that piece inside. Um, the date was a semi quick set. What I mean by that is if you move the time to like you know 11:50 and then cross it to over midnight, it would advance obviously, but then you can move it back to 11:50 and uh, it wouldn't jump back up to the previous day then you move it over midnight again and it'll advance another day so you kind of have to like you know move it back and forth for the quick set around midnight um so after that movement came out i think that's when jlc kind of started making strides in different models of the memo box some of the most iconic models were the Memo Box World Time, the Memo Box Parking, uh, an ultra rare deep sea alarm, and then eventually in modern days there's a Polaris with the three crown, and it finally also started using a, case, a double case back because the patent for the Vulcan Cricket expired. Um, another brand in the same year, 1969, came out with their alarm, and it was Omega. The Omega Memomatic Caliber SL980. This was actually one of the last uh, complicated caliber made by Omega before the course crisis. And one of the defining features of this was the alarm was accurate to the minute and in order to set something that accurate the alarm discs needed two discs one for the minute one for the hour and you can see it by one of the pictures showing an arrow and two parallel lines um, this function was special enough that when they licensed this out to Lamania 2980 that accuracy of the minute alarm was not carried out it was it remained in-house the SL980 also had a quick set date by pressing the three three o'clock position it only had one barrel um, you know still had a 360 rotor and it was very efficient apparently it only needed to be worn on the wrist for one hour to charge up the alarm and it lasted about 10 seconds. <clears throat> and then finally, in 1973, um, we came, we come to this watch, the uh, AS5008. This is considered the pinnacle of mechanical alarm watch, but it's still debated. Some people would argue the Omega is probably more difficult to make um, because it needed to be so accurate for the alarm setting but functionally I think this had more going so let's debate it it had a 360 degree rotor that wind both functions bi-directionally so one one clockwise could be for timekeeping counterclockwise it was for the alarm um, the only thing it lacked was you know, a hammer that struck uh, the case back. Uh, it instead struck a tone spring, which made the alarm a little softer. It was a, du a day day with dual quick set, uh, dual barrel. And if you ever look into like vintage alarm watch, a quick tip is if you ever see a day date alarm watch and it's not a Seiko, then it's the AS5008. So a few other things. I think I mentioned in the previous section of the review. So hacking, 4 hertz, 40 hours. Uh, this one had 25 jewels, uh, 2 language for the day and the 57 decibels. So yeah, that is kind of the evolution of mechanical alarm watch until the quartz crisis after that there were a few other advancements i think most notably is the gloss shootout original uh, senator diary 
that one that alarm you could set in advance of a month um, so a few other miscellaneous movement I didn't have time to fit in uh, so on the uh, upper left side you have the Belova version not too familiar with that one there's also the Venus 230 with a on and off indicator on the dial um, there's the uh, hand heart with the folding sound bridge so this was cool because it used that little back piece to amplify the sound but you could also fold it out to use it as a kickstand uh, there's the Brom Gartner BFG 90 with two power reserve indicators and then lastly there's a Pierce dual font with the ability to set the volume of the of the alarm all right that was quite long um, I hope you enjoy some of the information I've provided uh, like I said it's a real shame that um, the article on beyond the dial is no longer available so if it uh, ever does come back then head over there to check out James Wren's articles more detailed and um, yeah so I'm going to end the review thank you and see you next time